welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Thank you so much, Lewis. Look forward. So the first question I wanted to ask you um, was, I spoke to Go Gopal Das uh, a few weeks ago now, and I was fascinated with how his monk journey began. Um, he talked about how he had this great corporate life and gave it all up. And so that begs the question for, for, for you, how did you first to, to decide to become a monk or join the ashram? And what was your life like before you did that? Thanks, Lewis, for the question. Basically, I came across the Bhagavad Gita hmm. and uh, I got inspired to take on this battle against inattention, distraction of the mind, because the Bhagavad Gita describes about various kinds of careers people take to those who teach to remove ignorance, those who perform administration to fight against injustice, those who are involved in various kinds of skills and arts to fight against indolence. But the basis for all of this is absorption and the fight is against distraction and inattention. So recent study by Microsoft in 2017, they found that the average attention span of a human being in 2012 was 12 seconds and it has come down today to eight seconds. Even the goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. And so because of the influence of the internet today, the global users have increased from 413 million in the year 2000 to 4.62 billion in 2020. And 65% of the internet users in India use it every single day. So almost only 40% of the world population has internet access, but the addiction rate is 6% which is around 420 million people. And uh, on top of that, we find that almost 68 million search inquiries related uh, on the net are related to pornography. And the internet porn industry is worth $13 billion. And so distraction is causing American businesses losses up to $650 billion every year. And you hear about these car crashes which happen on the highways all the time. So 64% of all the car accidents which happen in America is due to distraction. And so I was very much attracted to the message of the Gita where Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna on the battle of Kurukshetra. And Arjuna is a skilled person and he has his ability to do things. But he has the skill, but when he sees a certain situation in front of him, he loses his will. And therefore the modern education system is focused so much on increasing people's skill. You may have the best machine, you may have the best technology, you may have the best systems. If the man behind the machine or the person behind the machine is not inspired to serve, not motivated to work, what will you do? Mm -hmm. Therefore, if there is a computer, it has an attractive screen, fantastic keyboard, everything looks bright and attractive. But if the heart is crashes, what is the use of that computer? So our entire body machinery is just like the computer but the mind is like the hard disk. Mm. And so I thought, let me check out what is this science of dealing with controlling the mind as described in the Bhagavad Gita and how is it so fascinatingly connected with the deeper mysteries of life and death. So I joined as a monk to dedicate my life to study and understand this and then not only contemplate, but also contribute by sharing with others. I'm interested. What did your friends and what did your family say when you told them that this is what you wanted to do? You were going to leave it all behind and become a monk. Were they supportive or, would, or did they think, you know, you're crazy? <laughs> That's a good question. 
Well, naturally, you know, I went to college not to become a monk, but in the course of the journey after I left college and I started working for some time and then I made this decision. So it was a conscious decision, but it was not something which people usually expected. And so uh, what happened was I was studying, I was like studying the Gita, I was doing a job. And then once I was on a, uh, you know, car journey with another very senior person, a friend of mine, a mentor, and he was driving me and we were on the road. And I was contemplating for the last few months that what should I be doing? I want to really become a monk, but you know, how will I actually make it happen? And so as we were driving, then the car was like moving at high speed on the highway. And then there was this divider in the highway and there was a gap in the divider. And we were right next to the divider. There was a truck which was trying to drive past us on the left side. And the driver of the truck saw the gap in that divider right in front. And all of a sudden, with a jerk, he tried to make a U-turn because the next U-turn was quite a distance away. So he saw that gap in the divider and he wanted to make a turn without giving any advance notice. He just moved the truck right in front of the speeding car. And right in front of my eyes, I just could see death personified. And within moments, our car crashed against the truck. And then, you know, there was the, the roof of the car caved in and my head went ahead and somehow by the Lord's grace, I survived and there was blood all over my body. And then, you know, we were taken to the hospital and it was a very, very, uh, you know, difficult scene trying to take out the glass pieces which had entered into different parts of the body. And so next day when I went to the police station, because they wanted us to come there and write a report and we saw the car. And the policeman there said, we cannot believe that those who are sitting inside have survived this. So actually, at that point, I was only 22 years old. And uh, I still feel that I got a second chance. Otherwise, that accident would have taken my life for sure. So that kind of gave me conviction that whoever has given me a second chance, I should dedicate my life for him and give it a try. And with that conviction, I embarked on this journey and uh, my family members, they could not really appreciate at that point of time, uh, but they appreciated the fact that, you know, it was a choice between finding a dead body on the highway versus someone who is there to tell the tale, but wants to dedicate himself for a certain cause. And now they are extremely happy and uh, very pleased with the decision I have made. And uh, there has been a tremendous transformation at the family front also. So in one sense in India, every in 2019 around, you know, 437,000 car accidents uh, took place and almost 155,000 people, they died. So way back in 1993, I could have been one of those deaths, but somehow I was saved and I thought I got a second chance. Let me give it a shot. And I'm here to share with you that commitment to the process will then actually define how much progress one will make. Because depending on where you decide or choose to give your attention, that will decide your disposition. And in due course of time, to experience contentment, we have to eliminate the unnecessary. And so before solving a problem, we have to define the problem clearly because clarity in thought, it requires a lot of hard work. Most people don't know what they exactly want to do in life. And so expertise also means we need to know what aspects to ignore and therefore inaction can be sometimes more painful than incorrect action and so we should not get totally into paralysis by analysis so absorption in a noble act is a force multiplier and so somewhere we have to decide yes i want to begin here whether we are victorious or we experience defeat because 
If you are afraid of defeat, then we lose the opportunity of utilizing the advantage which defeat brings because defeat can fossilize determined dreams into diamonds. And so the Bhagavad Gita is one such book which teaches us that comparison plunders contentment. We have to work on our consistency more than any kind of intensity. And it is the reliability which is the iron and that reliability attracts the magnet of trust. And in due course of time, courage and consistency gives confidence. So I thought that yes, life is full of uncertainties, a lot of challenges, so many question marks, but let's give it a determined shot. And therefore, sometimes we embark on a path to solve a problem, but sometimes the solution turns out to be worse than the original problem. And I did not want a situation like that. Just like in Delhi in the early 1900s, they experienced that the number of cobras in the city is growing. So the British government announced a scheme that if you catch hold of a dead cobra and bring it and give it to the government, then they would pay a certain small amount as a reward for catching and bringing a dead cobra. So they thought that this way people will be inspired to kill the cobras and the population will decrease. But alas, they did not realize that people would have a different way of thinking. Farmers around Delhi city started rearing cobras and the number of cobras increased. And then the British government realized that, oh, things are not working out. So they made an announcement that the scheme is canceled. Farmers were angry and they released the cobras which they were rearing in the Delhi city. And this is famously known as the situation where the intended solution is worse than the original problem is known as the cobra effect. And so with all the education, with all the intelligence, with all the resources and energy which we have, if we lead a life which is totally hedonistic, dedicated to enjoyment, thinking that this will make us happy, but amazingly, we find that a life which is totally dedicated to mindless enjoyment more often than not results in terrible frustration and anxiety. So therefore, we must remember that we should not try to perform any activity which is supposed to be a solution, but the solution turns out to be worse than the original problem. And we should not replay the Cobra effect. It's a powerful, powerful story. And um, the story you mentioned about the car crash, that is a, a powerful story of conviction that led you to make your choice. But I think for a lot of people, uh, they struggle with this idea of what people might think. So if they have a dream, they're scared what people might think. I had that problem. I started this podcast uh, two and a half years ago, but I wanted to wow. start it four or five years ago. Um, right. And when I first told people, I want to, you know, I want to start this podcast, this personal development podcast. People were like, people laughed at me. Um, people sort of joked and made fun of me uh, while I was in university and, and that I didn't, you know, I was scared of ridicule. So I stopped and I didn't do it and I prolonged it and put it off for two, three years. So that stopped me actually chasing my dream. What advice would you give to people in a similar situation to the situation I was in? where they really want to pursue a dream, but they're scared of what other people might say or think. Right. Solve many problems, ignore some problems, tolerate other problems. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is described that if you want to perform an activity which you love, love is like a river which flows around the rocks of scarcity, the rocks of impediment, the rocks of discomfort, the rock of unhappiness. And therefore, we have to first define our purpose. My first advice is focus on clarifying your purpose. Because if you lead a life for power and pleasure, that may thrill but a life dedicated for gratitude and servitude satisfies. Srila Prabhupada explains in the Srimad Bhagavad Puran purport 
that the endowment and withdrawal of powers happens by the divine will. And he says beautifully that we should not be proud of borrowed plumes. And so, Savai Pumsam Paro Dharmo Yato Bhakti Radhokshaje Ohaituki Apratihata Yatma Suprasidati. Bhagavad Puran describes that real love is that which is uninterrupted and unconditional, that which satisfies the heart. And so we have to realize that the quest for perfection has to begin with imperfection. And if you are inspired by a certain cause, then you must consult with your mentors and try to hear your voice from within and develop the confidence to be able to execute this because any relationship in this world is a balance between affiliation autonomy and appreciation and any relationship you have you cannot expect that people will not give feedbacks or not share their opinions but you must have the maturity to be able to balance that affiliation and the appreciation and the feedbacks which come with that affiliation and balance that with your autonomy because ultimately you have to lead your life so tolerate the past accept the present and you have to hope for the future and as it is said habit is the memory of a past experience of pleasure and so we have to steady the mind's fluctuation between hankering and lamentation and as you have beautifully narrated that it is many times the mind's fluctuation which sows the self-doubt sometimes you hanker yes i must do it then you start lamenting oh i'll never be able to do it i'm not good enough and therefore bhagavad gita defines happiness as a state without any hankering and lamentation and so the bhagavad gita recommends to lead a life which is based on service attitude that service attitude and intention of service produces determination and therefore dukkheshu anudvignamana sukkheshu vigata spraha vita raga bhaya krodha sthita dhir muni ruchyate in the bhagavad gita krishna says that misery is compulsory but suffering is optional just like in the winter season snowing is compulsory but whether i will be affected by the snowing or not will depend on how much preparation i have made to have my coat to have my house properly heated and therefore misery is compulsory but suffering is optional and the gita is giving us techniques and methods by which when you have to walk on a huge forest path which is filled with pebbles and thorns there are two ways one is you take a stone and try to crush every pebble every thorn in that entire area which is almost an impossible task how many thorns will you smoothen how many big pebbles will you crush the option number two is you wear a very thick heeled shoes and as soon as you wear the thick heel shoes and walk on those pebbles and thorns there may be unlimited thorns but none of them can affect you you are free to walk in any direction because you have immunized your feet from the effect and the influence of those thorns by wearing those heavy boots similarly the mind is like the feet and the practice of meditation is recommended to immunize the mind from the influence of all kinds of dualities and therefore that state of immunity of the mind against all kinds of ups and downs and dualities is technically known as equanimity and so the four levels of motivation are fear desire duty and love and therefore we have to choose what i want to work based upon what is going to be my inspiration am i going to work because i have some fear 
and if you work out of fear you will be filled with stress and so the gita recommends three very simple formula how one can overcome stress and anxiety first the gita says maintain your regulation yukta hara viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu yukta swapnav bodhasya yogo bhavati dukkha bhagavad gita says that if you lead a regulated life of eating regulated life of sleeping regulated habits and regulated work then you will not be going into extremes and that will keep your mind calm so number 1 maintain your regulation second very important krishna says that yes you are allowed to make your plans and krishna says karmanye vadikaraste ma phale shukadachana but do not maintain expectations so you are allowed to make your best plans and strive your level best but also be aware of the fact that we have only the opportunity to make the plans but there are million different criteria which may change the result are we ready to face the adjustment and change in the results and therefore winston churchill said famously he said happiness is the ability or the success is the ability to go from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm and so apart from maintaining our regulation altering our expectation to overcome stress the third thing is we have to drop the competition in the sense that sometimes it is comparison and tendency to compare which puts us under stress so let us try to understand what is my strength how can i add value what is my calling and then based on that when we are fully relaxed that yes this is my contribution and this is what i am going to do then you are not in anxiety about what someone else is doing or what some other person is planning or thinking because we are created to perform a particular kind of activity and share a certain contribution to the extent we are clear about that to that extent we will be free from stress so therefore the gita defines stress as a gap between expectation and reality one thing you mentioned there uh, briefly was mentors um mentors extremely important you hear about it a lot in personal development how important do you think it is for everyone to have mentors and what do you think the best qualities we should look for in choosing our mentors are yeah uh krishna explains in the bhagavad gita tad vidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshanti te gyanam gyanina stat pradarshina it is very important to have a mentor who would guide us on this journey by first clarifying the destination second sharing with us the most effective and the best path for the journey third pointing out to us what will be the obstacles we will face in the journey fourth helping us overcoming our doubts with respect to the journey and the path and fifth the mentor will help us overcome doubts which we may have about ourselves and therefore you know i remember when i joined the ashram i was very fortunate to be mentored by his holiness radhanath swami and uh, i remember that as soon as i joined one of the first services i received was uh, to cook in the kitchen and i was very excited about how i want to serve and i had my own plans and i kind of tried to execute my plans i made certain decisions on how i would work there and what kind of items i would serve and you know make everyone happy but then you know the way uh, i was trying to do things it was not uh, making people happy because 
I was thinking that if I cook in this manner, they will be happy. But then ultimately things happen in some other way. So I thought that, okay, why should I make chapatis? It is so cumbersome, this, that. Let us replace it with another item. So we replaced making chapatis with some other item and we brought in an oven and I thought that this was a very, very a great decision because this is going to uh, make the kitchen even more uh, productive and effective and more efficient. And uh, I thought it was a brilliant uh, decision. But then I saw that, uh, you know, people were not happy. And uh, then I discussed with uh, my mentor and then he said that, effectiveness of a decision is equal to quality of a decision multiplied by acceptance square so that was a pretty interesting that the effective decision is not just dependent only on the quality of the decision but more important than the quality of the decision is when it is multiplied by acceptance square that means if the acceptance of that decision is low no matter how good that decision may be people are not going to accept it and so as a, a new student i had the tendencies of becoming encouraged by positive feedback and be discouraged by criticism or some pushback and uh, room for improvement and uh, gradually my mentors they explained to me the a b c d e f as far as monk's life is concerned a refers to there has to be consistent absorption a refers to absorption b refers to we have to have deep beliefs beliefs in the fact with respect to the philosophy of the Gita. The Gita is trying to share about the various principles of Ishwar, Jiv, Prakriti, Kala, Karma, the journey and the destination which is not immediately available but can I maintain my beliefs and go through the ups and downs and still maintain that conviction and belief in this journey. So absorption in the prayers and the prayerful activities and practices of monkhood, they have to be consistent. So along with absorption, beliefs have to be deep and consistent. C is I'm not alone there. I'm staying with many other monks and we are on the process of uh, going ahead in this journey different monks will have different kinds of attitudes behaviors habits not just monks but also there are members of the congregation who have expectations they would give their feedbacks their opinions so man is ultimately part of a entire social ecosystem and if anyone thinks that i'll make it on my own that is lunacy and so the c uh, in this journey is cooperation and therefore cooperation between members have to be genuine I have certain strengths they have certain strengths I have certain weaknesses they have certain weaknesses how can we cooperate so that we can support each other in this journey and then the D stands for determination because although there is cooperation but ultimately each one of us has to make it in the journey on their own and so the determination has to be strong the determination to progress in the midst of obstacles difficulties challenges the determination to continue even though things are not working out then e stands for enthusiasm has to be everlasting because when you are new fresh then the enthusiasm is very high and you think yes i am enjoying this process why it is the newness and the freshness of the experience which is making us enthusiastic 
but do I have the capacity to go through this rigor for the entire life? So the enthusiasm to be everlasting and ultimately F means as a monk, I will be asked to perform any activity, anytime, anything, anywhere. The triple A in monk life. Anything, anytime, anywhere, we have to be ever ready. And therefore, flexibility for F is very important because sometimes when you are going through your academic pursuits, and in my own experience in the last 27 years, uh, I studied in a top college, but then in my journey as a monk, I have interacted with people of different genres of society and uh, many of them were not very well educated. They're coming from very simple backgrounds. But one interesting thing I observed is sometimes when people are not too intellectual and do not have such a very powerful, successful academic record, their ability to cope with defeats, difficulties, challenges, reversals seems to be much better. Why? Because they are used to more number of failures, difficulties and challenges in life than someone who spent his life riding on the wave of success after success. And many times in academic successes, it is just a bargain between our intellect, our ability to understand, analyze and memorize information and our ability to bring it out in a written form during the exams. And so the education system appreciates, acknowledges and rewards us for our ability to solve problems in the paper or on the screen. Based on the success in our ability to solve such theoretical problems, the false ego starts imagining that because I'm so good in solving these problems on the screen or in the paper, I can solve any problem in life. And that is a misnomer. And so when sometimes people have been pampered with too much success, even the slightest kind of semblance of a defeat or a pushback really crashes the enthusiasm of such people and spirals people into depression and distress. And therefore, one of the greatest needs in today's time is to help people increase their resilience. Last month, I read a book on mentorship and it told me that when you undergo a mentorship, it, it's like a cycle. It always ends with you become mentored to the point where you then become the mentor to somebody else. And um, I've been reading this book recently. Um, by Jay Shetty. Um, I've got it on my desk over here, Think Like a Monk. And you are referenced countless times throughout the book. <clears throat> and Jay talks about your mentorship and what that did for him. What do you remember about when you became the mentor to, to Jay Shetty? Um, what do you remember of that early mentorship? And ultimately, are you proud of the person he became to be? Of course. I am extremely proud that he is using the entire knowledge which we shared with him uh, in such a transformational way, in uh, such a powerful way by which people across the world in every possible situation and continent, they are gaining a lot from that experience. And uh, therefore, of course, when I first met him, I never imagined that uh, he would uh, actually uh, you know, be like a mover and shaker like this. But one thing about him right from the day one was his sincerity. And uh, he was extremely honest and open. And uh, in fact, I have been mentoring so many young people right from last 27 years. So, uh, you know, in London, I was coming from 2004 onwards and so many other youth in London were also in touch with me and uh, he was another person 
but the way he connected was he really took to the study of uh, the ancient wisdom of especially the Bhagavad Gita very very seriously and he was pretty intelligent and uh, he was doing well in his education also after that and uh, then of course you know during his uh, monkhood he really did his activities very sincerely all kinds of menial activities which he was asked to do he would do and along with that he was also very sincere in his approach to the studies and in fact uh, you know you may not have seen his handwriting but his handwriting is really one of the most beautiful handwritings i've ever seen of anyone like just like pearls so he would take notes very diligently and uh, then you know in 2015 he got this calling that he should really start presenting you know this uh, knowledge in a way which would impact people's lives in the language they could understand and uh, i think you know what he did after that was history as they say and uh, i uh, hope and pray that he continues from strength to strength impacting people's lives more and more and he talks about the fact that by leaving the ashram he's been able to um provide more of a service on a, on a wider scale so on that topic then why is it so important for every one of us to look to serve what does serving do for us right so this is a very very important point because sometimes people think that uh, life is only about uh, having money and fancy cars and gadgets and clothes and you know all this kind of stuff so there is an interesting uh, verse in the subhashit which says that asha nama manushanam kachit ascharya shrinkhala baddha eva pradavanti mukta tishthanti pangvat it says that all of us have desires we could use the desire either to serve or to enjoy and so it is said when you try to use the desires to enjoy asha nama manushya nam kachit ascharya shrinkala desire is like a very unique kind of a rope and what does this rope do baddha eva pradhavanti it's a very unique kind of a rope which has an opposite effect that when we are tied by the rope of desire those who are tied by the rope of desire they are moving around restlessly going from object to object person to person place to place trying to enjoy and still dissatisfied mukta tishthanti pangvat whereas those who are free from such desires to enjoy and are dedicated only to serve they are extremely peaceful so therefore the desire to enjoy can be at the level of the senses where we want to enjoy some object it can be at the level of the mind where we are trying to enjoy certain emotion it can be at the level of the intellect where we are attached to some particular idea or we are you know trying to enjoy at the level of the ego where we are trying to express our identity as better than others so therefore you know there may be situations where people may misunderstand us but we have to tolerate circumstantial mis understanding and so service requires a lot of patience and expertise involves the patience to avoid the distractions and the impatience to act too soon mm. and so the bhagavad gita shares with us the happiness sutra maximize the spiritual absorption of service minimize the material attachments of sense gratification and you may think oh this thought is bothering me it is forcing me to enjoy but a persistent thought may not always be pertinent mm. and therefore krishna describes to arjuna in the bhagavad gita that the fundamental foundation for service is discipline because if one is constantly self absorbed in thinking about oneself one cannot think about the object of service and what is discipline gita defines discipline as action combined with intention 
that is discipline and therefore when we are trying to serve others we are actually expressing our friendship and krishna says in bhagavad gita i am your well wishing friend and the fundamental foundation of friendship is transparency it is openness it is integrity it is honesty and only on this basis the relationship can be actually established therefore how do you establish such relationships only when we empathize with other person's feelings rather than being obsessed with one's own mm. and so once we are in the mode of goodness we can make a life changing positive decision that will elevate and transform and when a servant leader is in the mood of such service he can lead others into a bright future then that is only possible when a leader who is in the mood of service can reliably interpret an event and that interpretation has to be based on his authentic intention wisdom intelligence and maturity therefore the bhagavad gita is emphasizing on service and if we do not serve all the knowledge which we study and hear about will remain theoretical and we are all engaged in this spiritual journey to increase our faith but if we do not act on that faith and that action on the faith is known as service if i simply read a recipe book and memorize the recipes of 100 different delicious items that's not going to satisfy the belly and the tongue as much as if i know one item to some extent and i go to the kitchen and experiment with it therefore service is the application part of knowledge and so if we do not serve we are simply hovering on the mental platform and so we find that five types of atheists as my friend sutapa prabhu writes he says that the first type of atheist is a default atheist they have not even tried to understand what is divinity god this that but they have kind of accepted that you know there is no god nothing by default they are atheist so the second kind of atheist is a philosophical atheist where he is understanding of theism is very immature and raw third is an emotional kind of atheist because he goes through certain negative experiences defeats in life he just loses faith in god fourth is a covered atheist who starts thinking i am god and the fifth is a very interesting called psychological atheist which basically means that i study about god i read about god i speak about god tell others about god but when i am put in a situation where my faith is tested deep within i actually crave for the center of attention and i really do not have that genuine faith in god so therefore you know this is a very important principle only when we engage in service we can actually transform our knowledge into realization and bahu parishrama chandana remuna anila anand badila mane dukkhana ganila when we serve without feeling that i am going through any pain or keeping count of the difficulties and pain that kind of service which is done simply with a selfless desire to please that is known as pure service beautiful i have three quick questions left for you before you go the first one uh you've referenced the bhagavad gita a few times throughout this episode this question what are the three your three favorite books that you could recommend to me and our audience to read right so the three favorite books which i have is of course number 1 bhagavad gita second is another book known as bhagavat puran or the shrimat bhagavatam it is one of the 18 puranas 
and third is another beautiful literature known as Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, you know, what is special about these three books is they are helping all of us try to experience equanimity in different kinds of changes and difficulties. As we know that circumstances cannot be within our control, but we have complete control over our consciousness. So we have limited control over our circumstances, but unlimited control over our consciousness. So these three books reveal to us that yes, we have a tendency to consume and enjoy. We have a tendency to control. We have a tendency to convince others and make our point. We have a tendency to compete and try to defeat others. And these tendencies to consume, to control, to convince, to compete keeps us restless. Therefore, conquer over these tendencies by absorbing your consciousness in divinity. The New York Stock Exchange is one of the biggest of its kind. And, you know, on an average, the trading could even go up to $170 billion. And uh, the listed companies, if you take, is over $14 trillion. So one time in, in the you know, late 60s, few people did a publicity stunt. So the brokers were doing all kinds of deals on the floor and suddenly some of these went on the top and started throwing fake dollar notes, fistfuls of fake dollar bills. And everybody's attention was attracted and they, I mean, they got so bewildered, they gave up their, you know, trading worth millions of dollars and they went on the scramble to pick up these dollar bills only to realize that they were fake. So the world is full of such temptations. And this is the point which Bhagavad Gita is trying to make. That understand the ultimate uselessness, be focused and try to control such temptations. When there is an opportunity for instant gratification that may capture our mind. The urge within, you know, it will be too intense to tolerate. But it would be a mistake if we give in. And therefore, this Wall Street episode shows that if we give in to temptations, then we will feel frustrated, we will feel cheated, we will feel disappointed. And, you know, ultimately we neglect and damage our progressive path. And therefore, the Bhagavad Gita offers a various solutions to avoid such temptations. First, have the proper conviction that yes, I am on this journey and this is my path and I need a lot of discipline and self-restraint to say no to many temptations. Number two, have openness. That means have relationship with someone who will be your friend, philosopher and guide will offer you advice. Third is safety where you know that you will be provoked in certain situations, people and mindset, and you may be compromising your principles in that situation. So be on the safer side. Do not put yourself in such risky situations. And fourth is develop a taste, the higher taste, the better life. And once we embark on this journey, doing something progressive, pure and uplifting, then we will experience the higher taste. So these are some of the principles which make me very inspired by these literatures. The Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Chaitanya Charitamrita. The next question I have is, if you could deliver one small message or one small lesson and every single person on the planet would hear what you told them, what would your message to the world be? Experience love of God by cultivating devotion through A, B, C, D, association, books, chanting of the appropriate prayer and diet. And to do this, develop four attributes, commitment to 
excel at any cost mm -hmm. develop a problem solving mindset and not just be complaining about the problems have a global perspective because the world is now like a global family and ultimately let us have a collaborative approach there are things in different parts of the world which could be of benefit to us let us have a honeybee like tendency and get the best of knowledge available and ultimately develop such pure love within amazing the last question i have for you today what makes a life worth living a life which is dedicated to self transformation is worth living that transformation which will kindle the disciplined will of a spiritualist the broad vision of a humanist the creative imagination of an artist the critical thinking of a scientist and the analytical skills of a technologist and therefore i believe that a life dedicated to such self transformation is worth living Garanga Das, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. I really appreciated and enjoyed this conversation. I hope you have too. And I encourage yes. all our listeners to go and check you out on social media and follow more of your work and uh, get some more of your content there. Thank you so much, Louis.